Hey, my name is Ben Pierceman from bensbackwoods.com. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, today I've got some video footage from the Global Bushcraft Symposium in Alberta, Canada. Uh, the footage that I have is from Caleb Musgrave's presentation on breaking the rules with axes, where he burns out an old axe handle and then rehafts it with uh, green wood. And it was a fantastic presentation. Uh, Caleb is in Ontario, Canada. He His website is Canadian Bushcraft. I'll put a... Uh, I'll put a link down below there so you guys can check him out. Uh, footage is a little choppy. I think I've got most of the, uh, I think I filmed most of the, uh, the key points on his presentation. So stay tuned. Safest choice out of the two, season handle with a green wedge, right? My preference is, we, and I'm spoiled, I live in central Ontario. We have every kind of tree species of the hardwood you can think of there. So my preference is what we call blue beech, or muscle wood. It's a member of the beech family, it's very dense, tight grain, and its pores are very, very tight, and everything about it is perfect. It doesn't do a lot of shrinkage. So if I'm making a wedge, it's perfect. And then the handle could be dry wood. Vice versa, if I'm using green wood for my axe handle, I'm going to use a dry wood wedge. Why do I want that combo? What's going to happen? Well, there's going to be shrinkage one way or another, but something's going to happen. What's going to what? What's the number one thing that's in the green wood that we don't find in the dry season wood? Water, moisture. moisture. Oh, it's going to transfer. It's going to transfer, oh. and it's still going to swell. So there's going to be some sort of a filling up of that gap, just oh. a little bit, and it's enough to get the job done until you get home and fix your tool. I'm not making a permanent axe handle here. I'm making something because my snow machine broke down and I have to spend the next 72 hours stuck in the bush until RCMP or Jonathan, Jonathan MacArthur or somebody comes and finds my butt. So I need to make a handle until then, a temporary handle. If I'm smart enough, I pack the saw of some sort. It could be a saw, like a, a bow saw, like what Moore's recommends, inside your belt or inside your kit. I like folding saws because they're fairly portable. I can stick in my back pocket. They fit in almost anywhere and they look really cool. So. <laughs> Branches of those, Caleb? Uh, any hardwood uh, shoots or branches. I took some off that birch. Oh, perfect. Some of these are willow. It's any hardwoods I could find. My favorite that I've used in the past are dogwood because they bend so well and they, they really bind up tight on a jam yeah. knot. Yeah. But it doesn't really matter as long as it is. It's just a temporary. Excellent. Yeah, it's just temporary. And you can see, I'm not enjoying myself doing this at all. And the axe kind of pivots because the handle's really round. And it's bulky. It's actually thicker this way than it is this way right now. That's why I have to hold it down here and it makes me feel really weird. But I'm getting pretty good chops going. Flip over, start my hues again. Okay, take off that center piece. The bush goes. Okay. Now, I could use the core as the center of my axe handle. It's, it's okay. It's not great. But I want to go over to this side more and use this side as my handle. I even already have my cool little thing back at the bottom, my little palm swell. And palm. <laughs> I was really selective with that. Thanks, Ben, for you got the a, right yeah, one. Yeah, I seen a knob in there. And I was like, he'll, he'll, he'll use <laughs> Perfect. that. Perfect. Yeah. love that. Yeah. Kale likes knobby wood. <laughs> yeah. He likes weird stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm actually kind of holding it like this now. And it feels kind of actually comfortable. And I could potentially strike and just try to split, use this like a wedge. Okay, that's good enough. Take the axe head out of there, look at my handle. Poplar is prone to split off to one side, but that worked out pretty decently. Let's work with this one for now. Break even more rules, because now all the green is horizontal. <laughs> It's almost like I planned this. <laughs> did you hear that? I, I remember reading that the U.S. Forest Service did like a study on handle grain, you know, because they actually use it for for trail oh, clearing. Yeah. And they were like, the only thing that makes a difference is runoff. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've got my grandpa's axe and the grain is exactly backwards. It's a thin handle. Hasn't broke since he's had it. You yeah. Know? My experience, I've, my rule is if, if I hear a rule, I go and look at my grandpa's old woodshed and compare. <laughs> right, right, yeah. If they yeah. seem to be the same, I'll follow that rule. <laughs> right, right. But if everything else is different, I'll play with it. Yeah, I'll play yeah. with it. Now, kind of the inspiration for this entire workshop 
started off with seeing one of my my grandpa's axes with a bunch of soot and carbon all over the head. Mm -hmm. And I was like, nah, he couldn't have burned that out. If he did, oh man, that axe would be ruined. And then a few months later, my cousin rehung it and was using it, it seemed to hold its edges fine. And I burned axe handles out in that time period and always assumed that they must have had a problem, it's like the grain, the, yeah. the steel was different. And then I read uh, the bush, uh, the book that you wrote with Ray. And in there, you guys did it with a Gransfer's axe and had it tested at the Gransfer's factory. And the Rockwell hardness seemed to be totally fine. So we started experimenting with it. This is the fourth time I've burned this specific axe head. <laughs> We've done it a lot of times, testing this out with the same axe head. And just to reiterate how confident I am with what we're going to do today, that's one of the last Wetterlings that's still a Wetterlings. That still existed as Wetterlings before Grants was bottom out and then everything else changed and things went different. So an axe that I can't easily replace, I keep doing these experiments with, which shows you that I'm either insane or really, really, really successful. <laughs> <laughs> Or both. Yeah, more likely both. <laughs> Crazy is definitely in the combination somewhere there. So for those of you that didn't come by yesterday to the culture camp, this is called a Wagikmon or Crooked Knife. It's basically a, a North American First Nation indigenous tool strictly. Uh, you can see some tools that come over from Europe, like the, the hoof knives that are used by farriers, that can be used kind of like this, but they just don't work the same. They really don't. you got to get the right tool for the right job. Yeah. We also have twist to deal with here. So more of the mass over here has to be taken off. Your head won't be aligned then, you know? <laughs> nah, not at all. Yeah. My head's not aligned. Uh, yeah. See, that felt like another kind of joke there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just carving this down into a reasonable axe handle and then we're going to pop everything off and start burning. Now, could I use a green piece of wood as an axe handle permanently? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Put wedges in it. You can put new wedges in it, sure, but there's other options. So one option is if I'm using something like white or yellow, my preference is yellow birch. Carve it out with all the grain is exactly how you think you should have it. Make the perfect handle, make it a little bit chunkier than you think you need. Put your head on, use it if you want, but then heavily grease it. And I mean like heavily grease it. It should be dripping fat off of it. My preference is bear fat. You don't all live where there's bears, I know. But if you have access to bear fat, use it. If not, use white man's bear fat, and that's uh, Crisco or <laughs> coconut oil if you're a hippie. <laughs> but I like those types of fats for that, and then I soak it down with that fat, saturate that green wood with it. And then what I do, wipe the sweat out of my eyes. It is hotter here, I'm fat and hairy. This will be great when I go to Columbia next month. Um, what I then do is I smoke it. So what happens in hide tanning? What are we putting into the hide? when we first start tanning it. Once we've scraped off all the flesh and fat and hair and epidermal layer, what are we putting on it? Fat. And then what does the smoke do? Drives it in. It drives, so what it does is the tanning aspect, when you tan a hide with brain matter, or eggs or anything else, the fat matter, the emulsified fat, it only penetrates so deep. Even if you really ring in and do everything else, it only gets it about 40 to 60% tan. When you smoke it, it takes it to 95% or 100% tan. What it does, it pulls it in. The fat does the same thing here with smoke. So what I'll do is every night that I use that I have that axe handle for the first week or two, once I'm finished using it for the day, I'll strap it down to a board of wood that I know is straight, hang it in a lodge where there's a lot of smoke and smoke it for the night. Next day, take it off the board and use it again. And after a week, it's cured. I don't have to hold it on the board anymore. I don't have to do anything else. It's straight, it's cure, it's set. But I can still use it every day. That is a lot different than kiln drying where you gotta leave it in the kiln for how long? I can use it immediately because in the Americas when First Nations, my ancestors were doing stuff, we didn't have time to wait for cured wood and we live in environments where if you, let's wait for birch to die naturally <laughs> and season. In Ontario where we're surrounded by lakes and muskeg and humidity is high all year round, birch rots before it's seasoned properly. So we have to cure it, we have to force cure it and the one way we did that was soak it in grease not oil, grease. You can do it with oil, it'll work. Uh, and then smoke it. And make sure it's attached to something that keeps it straight. That's the real secret. Yeah, that looks like an axe handle. That's good enough for now. We'll finish it once I start getting the other part done. So now we've got an axe handle, semi carved. We don't really need this anymore. We gotta get all that wood out of it though. So, 
You do the one thing that always makes bushcraft people upset and cut string. <laughs> Boom, now if I really want to, you know, I can make that into a crown, make myself the king of the woods or something. <laughs> yes, it looks so good. Looks so good. And I have a spot over here that's dirt. Before I do that though, I want to confirm my theory, right? Always make sure you have an ability to confirm your theory. Who here has ever done blacksmithing? Any kind of metallurgy? When we go from hardening to tempering, what are we doing? What are we looking for? Color change. Color change, right? So if the whole axe is dark and scaly and covered in rust, I can't really see that very well when I pull it out. So in this way, if I shine it up with a stone or a file, just a little bit, just a little bit so I can see if there's any streaks of straw color or brassy color or, God help me, blue, <laughs> then I know. Then I know something's changed. That's, it's not a guarantee. It's better to still do a file test and everything else afterwards or take it to a Rockwell machine if you can. But this is a good enough in the field kind of situation. Good enough. Ish. Pack that dirt down as best you can. What am I doing here? Protecting the edge. How? Covering with dirt so it absorbs some of the heat. Insulating it. What's the ground? The biggest heat sink on the planet. The chance of me being able to burn this out and damage the temper the way I'm going to do it, just to clarify, the way I'm going to do it is very minimal. If I did it with a bunch of charcoal from a forge, yeah. If I blow air at it, yeah. If I use a big wood fire and build it up like I'm trying to fire kiln or act like I'm trying to fire pottery, yeah. I can definitely do it. But I'm using twigs and I'm trying to go fast. My rule. And it's really, remember, we're trying to break rules on this workshop, so feel free to break mine and see what happens. <laughs> but my rule, what I follow, is I'm not making a big fire. I'm making a fire here, I'm making a fire here. What am I trying to accomplish that way? Focusing the heat where? Where I need it. I don't want more heat on that metal than I have to. Right? What else am I going to do? Am I actually going to burn the handle out completely? No, you're just going to charge it so you can tap it out. I'm going to loosen it. I'm, 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 heat, I'm heat shrinking it. My genuine hope when I do this is I burn the wedge out. Done. Problem solved. Don't have to do any more. As long as that wedge catches on fire or burns away a bit, everything else can be done fast. Smoke the hell out of it. Whatever way you can. Build a smoking rack and keep it up there every night. But what do we do when we're smoking it? Keep it way above the heat. Strap. Keep it above Strap the heat, it. but Strap lash it down to something straight already. So that it doesn't twist on you. That's the one thing you'll... Hi! Oh, um, that's the one mistake people make is they think they can get away with keeping it up there and just, oh, it's, if I hang it like that, it'll stay pretty... No, won't it can twist. It can very easily twist. People take the time, let it cool down. Don't even put the fire out because that might rest pouring water nearby or getting it down into the ground and it hits down from underneath or something. Just cut back some of the risk. Just sit back, be lazy. There's a reason I look like this, because I take my time with stuff. Also, I like Wendy's. Ted, I had three kids in my tent. Next, Ted, they'd have three kids. There was always an adult in each tent in case there was an emergency or something. And to keep the kids from having like nightmares and all that, I guess, which we weren't helping. There. That's all the damage. Pass it around, it's pretty warm. Pass it around. And you see, I didn't burn the handle out, it's just charred and shrunk. So I can leave the head there, I might move it away from the charcoal that we have, or the, the coals that we have left, or ash. The color of that head hasn't changed, the bottom it doesn't seem. So let's take a look. In fact, it's warm down there, it's not hot. So I can probably pick it up at this point, but I'm going to leave it. But there's no brassy color at all, maybe a little bit up near the eye. If it's a hard, hard, hard wood, yeah. I don't, um, I don't wait for my hickory handles to, to season. Right. I carve them green, pop them on, use a hardwood dry wedge, uh -huh. and I grease the hell out of them and I smoke them. Right. Uh, most of my bows are the same way, and that's kind of where my inspiration behind that greasing and smoking method mm. came from. 
was Anishinaabe people. Has here anybody here ever made a bowl before? But has anybody ever learned how to make a bowl? Like knows like yeah. the basics. What's one of the first things they tell you? Seasoned Even hardwood, wood. right? For two years minimum. Do you think my ancestors had two years to wait to have a hunting bow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the uh, West Coast as much as other people do. <laughs> we got the hardwoods and we got the Mohawks as neighbors, so we need a bow right now. <laughs> would you guys? Would you guys treat uh, uh, canoe paddles the same way yeah. or no? Yeah. Yep, okay. Same way. Um, okay. Snowshoes even. Yeah. Um, although you really don't need to with a snowshoe, but I've done it. There's nothing wrong with that method. Yeah. Um, I like the smoke because it's a guarantee. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's speedier. If I'm greasing like a popple or a, or a birch paddle, I gotta grease it more often if I'm not smoking. Yeah. I gotta if, keep boiling. You it. figure that smoke is uh, maybe the heat is opening up the pores and driving it in there too. It basically. It's, that, it's definitely that. It's kind of almost like kiln drying in a sense. Yeah. Because it's yeah. in a warm environment. Yeah. But it's it's I have it like up in the top of a teepee yeah. or a wigwam. It's not down by the fire. You think at all. the actual like creosote kind of the heat and kind the creosote of, it's are kind of like of, how brain tanning works. Kind of working together and just like really. It's kind of like how brain tanning works. So brain tanning, the the, the the emulsified fat of the brain or the egg or whatever you're using, uh, it only tans the hide up to 40 to 50, maybe 60% of the way done. And then the rest of the way has to be done through smoke. And what happens is the smoke and the creosote carry a lot of that fat all the way through the hide and guarantees it's a thorough tanning job. Yeah. And then it fills in all the pores. Well, it's gonna do the same thing to this, just slower. So I can't get it done in a single day smoking, but over a week's time, yeah, it'll do it. Okay, so really big wedge, obviously. Uh, there's my spot. So I'm, I'll show you right now my little secret to know how wide to measure my wedge. Get under your sheet. You don't want to listen to me today. I put it at the front, and I kind of just chew it on the back here. You see that dent? Does everybody see that dent, or am I lying to you all? Yeah. Okay. That's where I just do my split and section that piece off. I'm squeezing the knife. Just in time, I can see that cloud, I'm trying to do this quick, but as Ben was teaching in his axe class, what's one of the four S's? Slow down. Slow down. I'm using a knife right now, I've got a sharp thing on my belly, all that. Does anybody want to bring me over a, just a chunk of wood to put this on top of it? I don't want to, we don't want to drive this down to the bird. There's a little one next right. to there, if that'll work. Oh, hello Mr. Fancy Pants. All right. Just about right. Hit it square. This wedge is kind of. It's wanting to jump out already. Around. Take some selfies with it for your Instagram. For its weight, it's one of the straightest woods for its weight. The grain is tight okay, so it doesn't shrink. Here, then, if that's yeah. the case. <laughs> but white birch is not far behind. Okay. Yellow birch is just a little bit better, so I have it available, so I use it. Uh, white birch is good too, though. The uh... think about Siberia. Yeah, no, and I think about it because Siberians like... have had axes for how many thousands of generations? Yeah. Just to think that they didn't like... have hickory. Well, that was the video. I hope you guys enjoyed that and uh, maybe learned something. Uh, do me a favor, like, subscribe, follow us. I've got links down below to my website, bensbackwoods.com, our Facebook, our Instagram. Thank you.